Hello, I'm George Fear, coming to you from Yorba Linda, California, location of Richard Nixon's birthplace and final resting spot for this week's episode of Over My Dead Body. Normally our guests aren't buried next to a library. It's better than a jail cell. Well, true. You almost didn't get a library. Hell, I should have a library in every state in the country for what I've accomplished, including being the only president to visit all 50 states. Hey, is this being taped? Of course. I have a thing about being recorded. Oh, so I've heard. What exactly happened to all those missing minutes? They weren't missing. I just wasn't talking. I was playing pocket pool, if you want to know the truth. There's not a lot of alone time for presidents. Plus, Pat wasn't putting out. Seriously? My shrink said it would be a good stress reliever. I see. I was under a lot of stress then. All of America was too. Then there must have been a lot of people playing with themselves. I know the damn hippies were. The infamous 37th President of the United States, Richard Milhouse Nixon, coming right up. Richard Milhouse Nixon is one of the most well-known American politicians of the 20th century, but he is also one of the most controversial. So how much do we really know or understand about the 37th President of the United States? From the end of World War II until his resignation from the presidency in 1974, he became one of the world's most famous heroes, but also one of the most vilified. However, it's never really been clear as to how this all happened. So today, let's ask him. Welcome to Over My Dead Body, Mr. President. Nice to be here. Thank you for taking the time to do this show. Not a problem. At least this time, I don't have to worry about a sweaty face. You're obviously referring to your appearance on national TV when debating John F. Kennedy. In fact, it's been deemed the cause of your loss in the 1960 election. It was the closest popular vote margin of the 20th century. Yeah, that was crappy. No one knew about it at the time, but I had a bad flu and fever and refused makeup because I knew the press would accuse me of trying to upstage that damn good-looking Jack Kennedy. My gray suit was the wrong color, and I got lost in the background while he stood out perfectly. Then those TV assholes used close-ups when I responded to the questions. And all the folks remember is that I looked sweaty and uncomfortable. Polls at the time revealed television audiences felt you lost the debate, but radio audiences thought you beat Kennedy clearly. I want a do-over. For the next few years, JFK jokingly referred to you as old sweaty face. Well, at least I have a face. According to one of the many biographies on your life, you play five musical instruments and you serenaded your wife, Pat, when you first met by playing the piano. True, true. And later that night, I showed her my flute. Uh, you mean clarinet. Uh, that too. So what's this I hear about your drinking? Hell yes. I was a lush and a two-pump chump. Three drinks was my max, and I'd be out like a light. It's been written that you were passed out during the perilous Apollo 13 flight back home. Could have been. You don't remember? Nope. I was also out during the Arab-Israeli War, ravaged by more than four years of war in Vietnam, 15 months of Watergate investigations, and countless nights of intense insomnia. My boy Kissinger covered for me, though. I was either drinking or jacking off. Perhaps at this juncture, Mr. President, you can give us a bit of your history before the presidency. Sure. People may be surprised to know that I was born to Quaker parents, second of five kids. Guess I got my sex drive from my old man. Anyway, as a teenager, my old man, Frank, a.k.a. Francis, was a gas station owner and grocer. 
He made me get up at 4 a.m. every day and drive the family truck into Los Angeles to buy vegetables at the market. And he'd make me wash and display them exactly the right way or else I'd get a whipping. My mother, Hannah, pretty much ran the family while taking care of my brother, Harold, who was always sick. Was your mother strict? Hell hath no fury like a Quaker woman who catches her son looking at dirty magazines with a sock on his penis. Oh, but what I really hated was how at seven years old, she'd make me practice the piano for an hour every day. Yet later in life, when I was president, I jammed with Duke Ellington at the Grand Ole Opry. In high school, you ran for student body president, but lost. My first election. It was rigged, dumb jock. I swear he was a communist. But screw all that. I graduated second in my class and was accepted at Harvard. Impressive. But my family couldn't afford it. My old man was a cheap ass. I read it was because of your brother's medical bills. Didn't do him any good. He died from tuberculosis anyway. Oh, that's rough. Not really. I just went to Whittier College and then got a full ride to Duke Law. No, I meant the death of your brother. Oh. On another note, you graduated from Duke third in your class. But instead of working in some big city law firm, you headed back to California and your hometown of Whittier to work at a local law firm. Why was that? Well, I wanted to be an FBI agent. But after I applied, I never heard back from them. I learned years later that I had been hired, but my appointment was canceled at the last minute due to budget cuts. Stupid morons. Couldn't even send me a damn letter. It's fine. It's fine. If I hadn't gone back, I'd have never met my wife. How so? Well, on a whim, I tried out for a local play at the community theater. I made the cut, and Pat made it as well. Do you remember the name of the play? Dark Shadows. I was pretty much hammered the whole time, but I remember it was something about witches and zombies or some shit. Good practice for politics. I learned a lot doing that play. A lot. So, Mr. President, is it true that Pat at first thought you were a stalker and refused your advances? One man's stalker is another man's romantic. She was just playing hard to get. On the third date, I told her I was going to marry her. What did she say? Christ, she just laughed. After that, I wrote her a shitload of poems to get her to change her mind. Oh, in fact, I have one right here. You wrote, And when the wind blows and the rains fall, and the sun shines through the clouds, nothing so fine ever happened to him as falling in love with thee, my sweetest heart. How did she react? She gave me a blowjob. Hmm. After you married in 1940, did you immediately join the Navy? Well, yes. I could have gotten a draft waiver due to my Quaker affiliation or faked bone spurs or some shit, but I had to do my duty. Made lieutenant commander, but never saw combat. Really, I was just a pencil pusher. What came after the Navy? These Republican guys from my hometown said I had the spunk to run for Congress. This was at the height of McCarthyism? Yep. It's amazing what can happen simply by calling everyone a communist. That's how I won, beating the pants off that Democrat Voorhees. Once in the House, I joined with the Committee of Un-American Activities and got to cross-examine Alger Hiss, the Soviet spy. Made my name on that pinko and then went on to beat Helen Douglas by planting rumors about her being a red lover. That's how you got the name Tricky Dick. Actually, I just got that from a group of college girls I hooked up with, but it carried over to my political career. In fact, I was so tricky that Eisenhower picked me as his running mate in 1952, and we won. But first you had to give the famous Checkers speech. What was that all about? Well, I had to save face for Eisenhower. He was going to drop me from the ticket like a hot potato. Goddamn press kept writing about a slush fund. Not illegal, not illegal, but it didn't look clean. So I went on national TV and admitted to the fund and said about my kids a dog with the money. So how bad could it be? And please, don't take my puppy away. I thought the speech was a total failure, but the people bought it, and Eisenhower said, you're my boy, and we went on to kick ass, 442 to 89. 
What was it like being VP? Like watching paint dry. It was until the old man had a stroke and a heart attack, one after the other. From that point on, I was more the prez than him, and it led to the 25th Amendment. In fact, I led the Senate in passing one of the first civil rights bills. I also got to travel a lot, which was fun. What happened in Latin America? The anti-American bastards stoned and spit on my limo. Mr. President, would you mind taking a few calls from our viewers? Of course not. Darren from Santa Barbara, welcome to the show. Hey, Mr. President. Hello, Darren. Santa Barbara is a nice town. Do you live anywhere near Oprah? She lives right down the street, but we never see her. Anyway, when I was a senior in high school, our social studies teacher played the entire Watergate hearings for the class and made us take notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> and to this day, I'm not sure who was the bigger cocksucker, you or my social studies teacher. Well, let me just say this about that. Don't underestimate yourself, sir. My guess is that you suck a pretty mean cock. And say hi to Oprah. Why don't you tell us a bit about the so-called kitchen debate with Khrushchev? You mean Soviet leader Khrushchev? Sure. He was a pussy. I definitely won that one. That drunk-ass leader couldn't formulate an argument if he tried. When I showed him some new American color television sets, he lost it. He lost it. He made fun of Congress and then sneered at the TVs, claiming his country would have the same sort of gadgets within a few years. Horse shit. What did you say? We went at it for a while, we did. I thought we were headed for a nuclear war right then, but he calmed down. A lot of people said I did a good job standing up to him. After that is when the Republican Party nominated you to run against Kennedy. We know all that went. By the way, do you know who killed JFK? Of course. Well, I hate to break it to Oliver Stone, but Aristotle Onassis orchestrated the whole goddamn thing. Kennedy's wife was tired of his philandering and met Onassis at a White House party. While Jack Kennedy was busy hitting on some bimbo, Harry walked over to her and said, If I kill the motherfucker for you, will you have sex with me? And she answered, If you kill him, I'll marry you. Before you know it, Jack's brains were fertilizing the grassy knoll, and Onassis had a young bride. So backing up a bit, after Kennedy was sworn in as president, what did you do? After that loss, I said fuck it to politics and wrote a book called The Six Crises. Was it a bestseller? Yes, sir. And because it was, I got talked into running for California governor against that space cadet pot-smoking brown. After you lost to Brown, you famously remarked, you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. What did you mean by that? Crummy bastards in the press. That loss messed with my head. Pat and I flew to New York to work for an international law firm. And that's where you became very informed on foreign policy. And five years later, you ran for president against Hubert Humphrey, with Agnew as your running mate. This time you won on a platform of honorable peace in Vietnam. The margin of victory was pretty slim. Humphrey was a homo, commie-loving lunatic. Plus, his boss, President Johnson, should have ended the war sooner. It assured my victory. Thank you very much. Most people thought you'd be a do-nothing president, but you accomplished quite a bit. Well, thank you for bringing that up, George. For a talk show host, you're not that bad. We took on welfare reform, civil rights, environmental issues, and law enforcement. In fact, you set in motion supplemental Social Security disability payments, automatic inflation rate increases for Social Security, affirmative action percentages for minorities, and you also signed the War on Cancer $100 million funding. I also signed into law the desegregation of schools. I created OSHA and the EPA and signed the Title IX Civil Rights Bill prohibiting gender bias at colleges. That's very impressive, Mr. President. Money went a lot further then. True, but you still had some issues, like hyperinflation and Vietnam. Could you please explain what exactly was your secret plan to win the war? Simple, really. I thought it prudent to let the people of Vietnam fight their own fight. We'd support them, but they'd do the combat role. You know, like die for their country rather than our boys. 
But then you resumed the bombing stopped by Johnson, and you even expanded it to Laos and Cambodia. Those little bastards were hard to kill. I mean, excuse me, bring to the negotiating table, meant to say. America went berserk. What do you have to say about the Kent State riots? The National Guard needed more target practice. Seriously, 2,000 protesters, and they only hit 13? Really? Damn straight, hippie, homo, pinkos aren't people. They're just communists waiting to happen. Anyway, my boy Kissinger ended the war, finally. You and Kissinger were also responsible for the so-called ping-pong diplomacy with China, which opened the door for talks and trade with the communist country for the first time in 21 years. Nothing better than a few friendly games of beer pong to get some tight-ass Asians to see things my way. Didn't the Americans get beat handily? Well, those sneaky bastards filled our cups with rice wine. Well, that shit will knock out an elephant, believe you me. Before we left, I got a hot shave and a hump from Susie Wong. <laughs> and the relationship with China that came about caused the Russians to agree to detente and sign the nuclear reduction treaties. Made the world a safer place, if you ask me. <laughs> and I got to squirt my juice. All that helped you get re-elected in 1972, when you beat McGovern in one of the biggest landslide victories in the history of the United States. 520 to 17, baby. He turned gay after that. So it's not clear why Watergate had to happen. My God, are you really going to go there? It's part of our history, Mr. President. So are pet rocks, damn it. Look, it all started because those sneaky Democrats were up to something with the press. They made me do it. The bastards made me do it. So you formed a group called Creep. Committee to re-elect the president. Thought of that myself. Interesting name. Well, they were nothing compared to the plumbers. Ah, yes. The illegal secret police you created to counteract any leak, like the one involving the Pentagon Papers, where they broke into the office of Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist and leaked his personal file to the press. Well, you sure do know a lot. Are you CIA? No. FBI? No, sorry. You at first denied having anything to do no, no, with no, Watergate. No. It was not a denial. I just didn't want to accept the truth of it. Just ask John Dean. Oh, that would be your White House counsel. He ended up testifying against you, Mr. President. Said you had him cover up the break-in. And yet, he recently told 60 Minutes that Donald Trump is far worse than you ever were. Well, how comforting. Having John Dean in your corner is like learning you have a tapeworm. All this led to the discovery of tapes which you made, but you refused to turn over to the special counsel. In fact, you ordered them burned. I was on medication at the time. You had quite an eclectic team of people around you back then. John Dean, G. Gordon Liddy, E. Howard Hunt, Jeb Magruder, James McCord, Edward Meese, all very bright people. But on the surface, they had nothing in common. Yeah, they had one thing in common. They can all suck my dick. And then there was Deep Throat. Oh, my favorite alone time Oh, movie. I'm referring to the FBI source who gave the Washington Post all their information. Wait, Woodward and Bernstein got it from the FBI? He revealed himself in 2005. Mark Felt, associate director of the FBI. God, I need a drink. The Supreme Court ruled you had to release the tapes, and at the same time, the House Judiciary Committee voted three articles of impeachment. I had a bad day. The transcripts revealed that you wanted to block the FBI's investigation into Watergate. You resigned right after that. You're a goddamn buzzkill. The tapes also showed that you did not like African Americans, LGBTQ communities, and certain religious groups. Meaning? Blacks, homosexuals, and Jews. Okay, okay. Busted. Emily from Tucson, say hello to Richard Nixon. Mr. President, you once said every one of the bastards that are out for legalized marijuana should die. Well, how do you feel that many states have now legalized it? Well, you're kidding, right? Ten states and rising every day. Holy mother of God, that's the end of America. Oh, and my husband wants to know about political contributions. In what way? How deep into a political candidate do the big donors really get? Do they have much influence? Well, let me just say, if it were possible, we'd all be pregnant. Floyd from Arkansas, go ahead. 
Yes, Mr. Nixon. Big fan, big fan. Well, thank you, Floyd. Hey, ever since I was a little kid, I'd watch people on TV who would imitate you. Some were good, some were not. I thought David Fry was pretty good, and of course, Rich Little got all the attention. So, sir, my question is, how did you feel about being imitated so much? Well, that's an excellent question, Floyd. Well, they do say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But I want you to know, I think an ill-spirited imitation is improper. Hey, would you like to hear my Rich Little impression? Absolutely. Hi, I am Rich Little, the world-famous imitator. When I'm not making fun of the president on television or in Las Vegas, I stay home and play with my two-inch weenie. Ha, <laughs> that's pretty good. Also, I thought your appearance on Laugh-In was hilarious. Hey, can you say, sock it to me? Of course, sock it to me. I also read that one of your nicknames is Gloomy Gus. Some say that's because of your overall demeanor, but others say it's because of the time you made the mornings in America a bit darker. All because in 73, I wanted to save fuel during the energy crisis, and I signed into law year-round daylight savings time. Kids ended up waiting for their school buses in pitch dark, and there was a constant fear that they were going to be hit by traffic. Well, I said just give them flashlights, which went over like a lead balloon. You win some, you lose some. Christ. Speaking of which, I read that you had a three-lane bowling alley built in the White House. Absolutely great stress reliever. Almost better than whacking it. Incidentally, I had my staff paint the faces of my enemies on the pins and then knock the crap out of them. Bastards. I bowled a lot. I had a lot of enemies. No, you're joking. I once took out Khrushchev, Woodward, and Bernstein on a 6 7 10 split. I heard you were pretty good. My high score was 232. So, Mr. President, with that score in mind, how do you explain being practically the best at everything and then having to resign the presidency? My dad wasn't around to whip me. In truth, sir, your terms weren't failures at all. Tell that to Woodward and Bernstein. We have time for one more call. Angela from Minnesota, you're on live with Richard Nixon. Hi, Mr. President. I have a two-part question. Well, fortunately for you, I can multitask. Why do presidents get involved in sex scandals? And what do you think of Donald Trump? Those are very good questions, Angela. And it's a subject to which I've afforded careful analysis. I've concluded that presidential sex appears to involve blowjobs almost entirely. Jack Kennedy and his brother Bobby are well known for getting blown pretty much everywhere they went. Plus, they both had regular sex with Marilyn Monroe. I saw that on the Discovery Channel. Well, this spilled over to their older brother Teddy, who was getting his sausage smoked as he drove off a bridge. I see. Fast forward to JFK's son, John Jr. Well, he got his knob polished in the private plane he was flying and took his wife and sister-in-law on a nosedive into the Atlantic. I guess you could say everybody went down that day. Well, that's correct. And of course, Bill Clinton got impeached for getting gummed by his intern. A shot heard round the world. When you put it all together like that, it makes me not trust anybody in public office. Well, let me just say in their defense, Angela, public office is stressful, and you need to blow off steam at regular intervals. The First Lady can only handle so much, and often she's out of town, or we are, and getting oral sex within the marriage may not be a viable option. Incidentally, she's under a lot of stress as well, and has her own support staff, if you know what I mean. So, is President Trump doing the same thing? I doubt it. He looks pretty wound up. Maybe Kellyanne Conway will step up to the plate. Or Nancy Pelosi for a bipartisan effort. Mr. President, are you aware that Donald Trump once employed a political consultant with a large tattoo of your face on his back? Of course. That would be Roger Stone. Or as I call him, Daddy's Little Girl. I understand he's headed to prison. Guess I'll soon be part of a threesome. Martin Luther King once said, Richard Nixon would wear a suit and tie to the beach. Did you two get along? 
Well, Martin was jealous of what I was wearing because he couldn't keep his clothes on. He cheated on his wife more than every other president combined. And he still got a federal holiday and a postage stamp. If by some chance you were in the Oval Office today and in charge of things, what would you do? I'd pour myself a scotch, watch old movies, and let Congress kill each other. The Library of Congress lists 278 books written about you. Do you have a favorite? You have it right there, my memoir. Uh. Christopher Lieben Haupt of the New York Times calls RN the best presidential biography ever. Plus, it has a catchy title. We're almost out of time, but, but here on page 273, you talk about an interview you gave Ms. Magazine in 1971. Would you share with your viewers what you said when you were asked about women's sure, lib? Sure, sure, I said I had nothing against women's lib, but I wouldn't want to wake up next to a female pipe fitter. Nice. Any last words, Mr. President? I am not a crook. Peace, peace, peace. Thank you very much for your time, sir. That's it from the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California. I'm George Fear, and we'll see you again soon on the next episode of Over My Dead Body.